Blog Talk Radio. Namaste, everyone. This is Andrew Fisher. It is May 6, 2015 on Nature of Reality Radio. We are broadcasting every Wednesday from the suburbs of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to expose the true and false nature of reality for what it is and what it isn't. Today on the show, I'm supposed to have Vinny Eastwood, radio show host from New Zealand, one of the most popular radio show hosts in New Zealand. I hope he's going to be on. I tried to email him yesterday as well as a couple days before then to remind him about the show, and I never got a response from then, even though when I originally contacted him, he said he would be able to make it on. So I will cover the news as usual, and hopefully uh, by the time I've done the news, he will uh, have called in and I'll see him in the queue. If not, I will uh, send an email or a message to him, and hopefully he will respond to it. I don't have any backup plan for this show. If for some inexplicable reason he doesn't come on, I'll uh, try to get him on some other day this week. And if that doesn't work, then I can do a show hosting by myself with no guest uh, sometime before the next show next Wednesday night, but uh, Vinny Eastwood is supposed to be the guest, hopefully he'll call in, he is a popular, humor-loving radio host from New Zealand, and uh, he has discussed all slew of things on his show, from conspiracy theories to raising consciousness, and uh, his show is The Vinny Eastwood Show, which can be found at, the web address is www.thevinnieeastwoodshow.com, spelled exactly as it sounds. And um, Vinny's major goals in life is to train others to do what he does so that they will no longer need the help of people like him to wake up humanity. So that's a quick little bio there. I'm going to, of course, start with the news, courtesy of Alex Jones and company at InfoWars. First article here, crazed feminists threaten beheadings over hashtag how to spot a feminist. Uh, Executing political dissidents is uh, trendy and liberal. Yes, uh, threaten to behead people is not protected by freedom of speech. You cannot make terroristic threats like that. And uh, maybe sometime after the show, I'll check out this how to spot a feminist hashtag thing. But uh, don't have time looking into it now. Got some other stories here to cover. Next article, group impersonating cops claims to be Masonic descendants of Knights Templar. California Justice Department deflects questions after aid to Attorney General arrested. Okay, uh, kind of confusing here. A group in person in cops claims to be Masonic descendants of the Knights Templar, and then the sub-article says the Justice Department deflects questions after aid to Attorney General arrested. Okay, it doesn't seem to be a connection there between the uh, main headline and the uh, sub-headline uh, here, but um, any group impersonating cops, if they're not cops, that's, uh, no, we got some serious issues there. You cannot deceive people like that. I mean, we as citizens... I shouldn't, some people say you shouldn't use the word citizens because citizens seems to imply slavery. But um, we, the common people, have just as much a right to make a, so to speak, citizen's arrest as much as the cops do. There are servants where they're masters. So if they have the right to arrest people, we have the right to arrest them. So, But you don't have the right to impersonate cops regardless of whether or not you're Messiah descendants of the Knights Templar. Our next article, Representative Gommert on Jade Helm. We never named a state hostile. Quote, I have participated in or observed military exercises. However, we never named an existing city or state as hostile, he said. Okay, uh, according to the diagram of the whole Jade Helm thing, California, Lower California, Texas, and Utah are listed as hostile. So don't exactly know what someone's definition of hostile is, but... Um, I think uh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, Representative Gummer, when he says a state has never been named hostile when it has been color-coded as such. But anyway, next article. Corporate media connects Garland shooters to ISIS through British hacker. Uh, Junaid Hussein spent time in British prison for hacking Prime Minister Tony Blair's account. All right, was this um, Garland shooting a false flag? Well, kind of hard to tell at this point, but... Uh, it only makes perfect sense to assume that it would. I mean, a lot of people say you shouldn't think that it was a conspiracy. You shouldn't think Harp caused the hurricane. You shouldn't think it was uh, staged by the government. They want you to think that because if you think that, you're going to give them their power. Yeah, but the problem is if you don't research it, you're not, not going to learn the truth. So just for the sake of drawing a balance, let's uh, keep in the back of our minds that it could have been a false flag. Haven't had a lot of time to look at this whole thing, but um, it could very well be considering we're talking about ISIS and hackers and, and all that stuff. But uh, our next article, this is Red Linked. Red Alert, Stealth, Internet, Attack, Detected. InfoWars Facebook taken down for harmless image coupled with quote from Stalin. 
Okay, uh, more internet censorship. Um, I don't know if maybe they're going a little extreme here, making this a red-linked article. But, um, I mean, they were victimized, so I think naturally they would want to put in red link if they're the ones being victimized. But don't blame them. I guess it does make sense there. If something happened to you, you would consider it a red link like that. But uh, Facebook censoring people, that's nothing new. Just ask me. I've been banned a zillion times for posting my radio show and other videos around like crazy. All right, next article, hospital. Vaccine is causing babies to stop breathing. A nurse details how hospital new vaccines would cause babies harm. Yes, and yet they continue to give uh, them the vaccines anyway. Uh, in fact, when I was at my uh, job yesterday, I was trying to call the um, Veterans Affairs Department near where I am um, just for some some stuff that was work-related. And on the messages, they actually talked about um, one of the options. If you want to do this, press 1. If you want to do this, press 2. Well, one of the things was if you want to get info about vaccines, press whatever button. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, well, should I, do I have to be telling these people that vaccines are toxic? It's, it's disgusting and pathetic. Well, uh, whatever the case, this uh, hospital doesn't know what they're doing. Next article, shocking, martial law preparations confirmed. Confirmed, ooh. All right, sub-article, verified government documents outline plans for civil unrest. <laughs> Wonder why this article is not red-linked, unlike the other one, which was red-linked, but was specific to InfoWars Facebook taken down. Well, um, I mean, martial law preparations, haven't they always been confirmed? I mean, those documents from 2010 that were released um, sometime in like mid-2012, talking about how there were plans to round up Americans and put them in camps, the FEMA camps. And uh, Alex Jones was able to uh, talk about that after it was leaked to him and a few other people by sources within the government. And the, pe- and the army um, said, you guys should not have that, but yes, it is ours. So um, I don't know what what this is new here. I'd like to check it out. I'm sure they'll talk about it later on in the news. But uh, just know that more things to confirm martial law have been prepared. One last article here. Huckabee slams Obama for stripping grandmothers while known terrorists uh, tweet they are going to attack. The biggest mistake, he will not identify this enemy as Islamic jihadism. Okay, well, Islamic jihadism controlled by the government and this whole thing of Obama stripping grandmothers, not exactly sure... uh, what exactly this is about? Maybe it's a TSA related thing. I remember uh, many many years ago, this old lady um, was trying to sue the TSA because they forced her to strip search in a private room, just singled out for some inexplicable reason. I don't know if he's relating to that specific incident, but um, it may be. So um, when terrorists are tweeting they're going to attack the government, lets it happen because the government is controlling Al Qaeda. It's sick. <laughs> All right, well, folks, I'm going to check this out. Hopefully, Vinny is in the queue. He's not. Okay, I don't know what's going on here. I hope everything is okay, but uh, folks, if you'll excuse me, I'm just going to put myself on mute here so I can uh, try to contact um, him through email and see what's going on here. Uh, Folks, this is Andrew Fisher here. I just went to Vinny's website, and I'm seeing something that I never saw before. There's this... uh, Message you're saying, okay, folks, I'm going to lay my cards on the table. I'm feeling really burnt out now, and I need a break from doing the show. I'll be finishing my documentary, hope by July 4th and the weekend of May 1st. I'm directing the first crew. There's only 48-hour film festival crew, and hopefully we win. Okay, I I don't know why Vinny um, would not contact me to tell me about this, but if this is a uh, sign that he's not going to be coming on the show, then... Uh, and we've got some serious issues here. It would have been really nice if he could have uh, told me. So uh, hang on a minute, folks. I'm going to try to email uh, Vinny here and see uh, what's going on. Well, folks, I just sent Vinny uh, an email. Um yeah, I can't. I don't know how long ago he put this uh, notice on his uh, on his website. There doesn't seem to be um, be any notice here. It's exactly where he put that. But for him to not uh, contact me to uh, to tell me that he would be uh, canceling the show does uh, is a little upsetting. So hopefully, I'll get a response from him in the uh, in the very near future, within the next couple of minutes. So. Uh, Oh, 
Oh, folks, I just see uh, Vinny sent me an email on, on Facebook, a message on Facebook. He should have called in right now, so I don't know. Uh, oh, let me try to contact him on Skype. Okay, folks, I did just contact him on uh, Facebook, and I just contacted him on, on Skype. I don't know why he hasn't uh, contacted me, but um, he should be. He said he's going to be on, so... Uh, Let's see. According to his calendar, let me let me let me check here what he wrote here. He's um I okay hold on you are supposed to it's not Skype to Skype I'm telling him. Okay, he's calling now. Let's hope he knows how to call uh, American numbers from New Zealand. I'm sure he does because he's foreign guests, American guests on his show. So, uh, said he's calling, so let's just hang tight. He should be on any second now. Tried to add him as a friend on Facebook the net, but just now, but he's got too many friends already, so can't add him. Ah, there he is. Vinny, how you doing? Area code 661, is this you? Yes, it is. In fact, I thought I was area code 666. No, it's 661. So um, I'm oh, glad to see you. Yeah, I figured you, figured you knew how to call uh, America from New Zealand. I had a British guest on my show once who had no idea how to call America from uh, the British Isles, and it took forever to get him on the show, but I'm glad that was not a problem with you. So uh, it's great to have you on here. Um, I was a little concerned, though, because I see you're actually taking a, a little bit of a break here. Um, there is this documentary that you're uh, supposed to finish by July 4th, uh, Independence Day here in America. I'll uh, give you the chance to, uh, right now, um, just to start off, give us the inside scoop on what that documentary is about. Okay. Well, you know how uh, there's an agenda to conquer mankind, okay? You know, getting us to sacrifice our liberties for security. It's corrupted the medical industrial complex, the military industrial complex. It's it's corrupted free, uh, Freemasonry, a lot of uh, uh, mystery schools and, and, and that kind of thing. There's a huge multifaceted agenda that is really complex in how it all works together and this is the reason why the conspiracy has been able to remain concealed because people don't understand how all these little individual facets work together to produce an overall result of uh, dumbing down, enslavement and uh, debt, you know, that kind of thing. So. My idea of the documentary is to do the direct opposite of what everybody in the truth movement has so far done about their documentaries. Certain people will go and they'll say, we want to pick a topic. Let's say it's vaccination or uh, uh, chemtrails or something of that nature. So they'll pick one topic and they'll expand on it for the length of an entire documentary. By the end of it coming away, you've got one subject matter in your head that you go, okay, it's definitely that way. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to take a rather eclectic mix of all the varying types of conspiracies, how they all mesh together, and summarize them in a very quick, succinct format so that at the end of this 90 minutes, you'll actually understand what the core of each and every um, part of the main staples of the conspiracy realm is, exactly how to comprehend their machinations, and how they fit together. Now, it's basically laid upon the groundwork that all these other documentary filmmakers have done over the years. They've all given us the information about these individual topics. Once you summarize all the topics together, it will give people such a clear picture that they will no longer be confused and they will no longer be afraid due to its complexity and due to the fear of not understanding it. And the end of the documentary is... Uh, primarily about trying to inspire people because when you when you're learning about this stuff it'll scare the frickin' bejesus out of you there's there's no two ways uh, to slice this this piece of toast all right it will scare you it will make you feel depressed you may lose your friends <laughs> after watching this documentary and you're going after them and saying this that and the other but 
we want to give you some examples of successful resistance to tyranny throughout history and some simple techniques how each and every person can contribute to this fight because after all it's those people who are being affected by these various eclectic conspiracies who are the only ones that will be capable of resisting it and they won't be able to resist it if they don't understand it and that's the whole point of the documentary. Now, I told a guy about this um, and said that I needed a computer for it, a very powerful computer, because I've been trying, I've been making uh, maybe two hours per day of uh, talk radio and video for five years now. And ever since, I think maybe a year or two ago, I've been noticing some, shall we say, limits to the technology that I currently have. Um, every piece of gear that I have has been donated by listeners. I've got you know, stacks of external hard drives, uh, several 27-inch uh, iMacs and, and a big screen TV and backdrop and lighting and several cameras, microphones, the whole nine yards, every single thing of it, I haven't even been able to afford a cent of it. It's all been bought for me uh, by my listeners and uh, the same thing has gone for this documentary. I needed a camera that was worth about $2,000, and I just found out that that camera doesn't work, and I can't actually return it because it was off a person off a private sale, <laughs> so that's a paperweight. Um, however, I've got other cameras, and, and I've got a few mates who have their own uh, gear, that kind of thing. I don't know if anybody in New Zealand would like to donate me a camera, like a really decent one that I can plug in, separate audio channel, that kind of thing. I don't know. I don't know. But the main thing was uh, the six thousand uh, dollar Mac Pro, which is approximately four to five times as powerful as the computer that I'm currently using. Now, the other day I was struggling because I needed to catch up on seven different episodes of the Vinnie Eastwood show and at the end of each episode you've got to uh, make the video for it right and you've also got to split that video into six separate videos once it's split into six separate videos then you can upload them and I had to do seven full shows um, and some of them were shorter they were me guesting on other things so in terms of the power that I got out of this machine I edited 30 separate videos in one day. Very few people can do that. I wouldn't have been able to do it if I didn't have the technology, but very few people, full stop, even if they had the technology, could have done that. And that's because of that constant, every single day I'm churning out the work kind of cycle that I've got. Now, I told a man what I was planning to do with this documentary, I told him that the machine cost 6000 New Zealand dollars. That's 4000 US. And he said, okay, I'll give it to you then. Uh, and I think about a week later, he rolled around to my house with 60 New Zealand $100 notes, tapped in on my desk, and I went around and uh, got, got the computer. Um, however, he is not capable of even affording that six grand. He simply works. Uh, uh, during the year and often his work dries up towards the end of the year around the other uh, November, December margin so he needs that money back and the first 48 hours of actually uh, telling people about this guy who donated this money and, and we need to uh, get some more donations in to help uh, reimburse him for his initial generosity uh, within 48 hours I had 2000 to give him and uh, now I'm uh, uh, fundraising again, and uh, there's only, I think, about maybe three and a half grand left uh, to pay off on that uh, particular account, and then we're all set to go, everything's uh, done, there's no problems whatsoever. Uh, and I'm just trying to relax at the moment for at least the uh, the next week, because after coming off of four months of talking about child rituals, satanic abuse, and pedophile cults, and, and things of that nature. Uh, I'm, I'm a little emotionally fragile, and this happens to me every couple of months, generally, because I, I, I do try to interview people um, in a very empathetic format, 
but this means every time I interview somebody who really has been truly traumatized, I feel and take on some of that trauma for them and allow them to open up and uh, really kind of uh, get some of their baggage off. The consequence is I take their baggage off them, and so I have to get rid of it myself somehow. But yeah, that's where I'm at. Thank you, and I'd like you to enlighten us a little bit on the geography here. There's a quote here on your site which says, New Zealand is so corrupt that no corruption gets reported because those charged with exposing corruption are also corrupt. Okay, so many people um, probably are not aware of uh, the politics and everything in New Zealand about how it might be any more special or unique compared to other countries. So I guess I'll give you the chance to enlighten us here on um, the current state of affairs uh, in regards to how the New World Order controls New Zealand and maybe even enlighten us on some history and geography if you want as well. All right. Well, uh, we're a British colony like the uh, like the USSA and the thing about New Zealand is it's it's not isolated. People think that it's isolated. No, 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 it's remote. There's a difference. It means you can get here pretty easily, but once but once you're here, <laughs> leaving's a bit of a problem. Um, okay, so we were number one on the list of uh, Transparency International's list of the least corrupt country in the world. Okay, now how could I say that New Zealand's so corrupt that no corruption gets reported? Here's why. All of the signatories for the form that Transparency International send out are working for either the government or private business, and they sign off the forms as they come out. So how does Transparency International, the organization who determines who's corrupt and who's not, actually make their decisions? Well, it turns out that they send a questionnaire to the corresponding governments, and they go, hey, bro, and you go, yeah, have you... Uh, have you got any major corruption in all of your power centers there? And New Zealand goes, Why oh, no, we don't, and send the form back blank. <laughs> and so we, we get number one least corrupt in the world. Now, it's, it's really quite incestuous, all of the relationships that go on here. I mean, think about boss hog, small town kind of corruption sort of thing going on, like everybody knows it, nobody talks about it sort of deal. Okay, so let's start with uh, the justice system. We've got about 160-odd judges, high court judges and justices here in New Zealand. About 120 of them are related by first cousin at least. Try getting an independent judicial review in New Zealand. And they're all part of an old boys club. So it's an incredibly corrupt court system. You don't have to have court records in New Zealand. Okay, it's a court of record that doesn't keep records. So if that you say anything or the judge says anything to implicate themselves in a crime or anything, and the, the plaintiff goes, hey, well, hold on a second, what's going on here? I can prove this, I can prove this. And they go, really? Do you have a recording of it? <laughs> so so there's, there's that. You can't get justice in New Zealand. And I'm, I'm talking in a very general way. Of course, the, um, in order to keep scumbaggery concealed, you need to have the majority of things that the public see as operating as per usual. So you'll see things in the, in the news about murderers or p perhaps somebody who's a little bit corrupt or something going to jail. These are little pieces of meat that you hang up for the public and basically help them to placate themselves into believing that corruption is not really that big of a problem here. Even when Deloitte's, which are one of the biggest accounting firms in the country, uh, aka known as the Pinstripe Mafia, have even come out in mainstream news and saying that corruption is actually now a very big, significant and noticeable problem in New Zealand. So that's the judiciary. On to the Prime Minister's office. Now, in the United States, in, uh, the president will basically be corrupt by being A, financed by lobbyists, and then B, passing whatever legislation those lobbyists might want via executive order. In New Zealand, it's much the same, except it's uh, a lot more convenient because all of these donations that can come through for these political candidates uh, can be anonymous so long as they're under $10,000. Now, the record keeping for donations, I think, is a bit suspicious. There was uh, one MP 
His name is uh, Peter Dunn for the United Future Party, and they're a coalition partner with the current national government under John Key. And I asked Mr. Dunn what kind of donations he was receiving in the year of 2013 leading into the 2014 election. And instead of answering me, he simply directed me to the elections.org website, where I discovered that in the year of 2013, the selected member of parliament and his entire party got zero, zero donations of any kind from anyone. No private donations, no public donations, no anonymous donations, nothing, which I find very suspicious. I don't have any proof that these people are taking money on the side, uh, from lobbyists or whatever, but knowing how corrupt New Zealand is, by speaking to the activists who have actually been at the forefront of this game for as long as they have, it occurs to me that there must be something wrong there. Now, in terms of the Prime Minister's office, this is how they get uh, legislation passed. It's called under urgency. So if you've got a piece of legislation, which nobody wants, but you want to pass it anyway, regardless of what the people say, regardless of what all of the other parties in Parliament says, even regardless of what your own caucus says, you, the Prime Minister, have a basically dictatorial power to say, we're passing this under urgency. Okay, there we go. It's done. For example, he, uh, the Prime Minister, John Key, is a Federal uh, Reserve banker. Like mincing words here, he literally worked for the Federal Reserve uh, right after the repeal of Glass-Steagall Act in 1999 and was the head of the European bond and derivatives trade. He worked in Ireland and then skipped out of Ireland and put all his money into blind trusts after assisting about 20,000 of his clients to avoid tax soon after the Irish economy was hollowed out with debt and collapsed shortly after. He comes to New Zealand as a prime minister, you get to appoint all of the ministers. Okay, so you've got a minister of health, you've got a, a, a minister of the economy, a minister of this, that, and the other. And the prime minister by himself gets to appoint any of these people. Right, so he stacks an entire cabinet full of cronies. Those cronies then go out and they do the, and they do the prime minister's business. Now, in order to hold a prime minister accountable, you need to go through the prime minister's office. Now, the problem with the Prime Minister's office is it's not a creature of statute and is governed by zero rules of conduct. I only found that out a couple of weeks ago. They can lie legally and not be, and not be held up for it. They can deceive. Uh, they, can, they can do pretty much anything as long as they don't get caught out in public on camera or something. And because the media are in their pocket, that doesn't happen even when it happens. Think about this. The largest uh, media entity in New Zealand that isn't government owned is a company called MediaWorks. It owns TV3, TV4, uh, Radio Live, uh, News Talk ZB, etc. These are the main talk radio stations, the main news stations, etc. <sighs> and in the election in 2008, when this current national government came to power, the person who the Prime Minister appointed his communications minister was the former CEO of Media Works, Stephen Joyce. In that same year, after being elected, he brokered a $40 million bailout for Media Works and didn't ask for one share in the company. Now, you want to talk about socialism? This is the worst form of communism I know. You give money to failing companies who propagandize and, and give BS to the public, <laughs> and you get the public to pay for that bailout. On top of that, what you see now is the draw and the drive from that mainstream media entities to conceal truth, to protect the prime minister, and this kind of thing, because they're beholden to the man who, who, who gave him $40 million. Now, what's happened now, more recently, is Campbell Live, uh, John Campbell rather, uh, is probably, I'd say, I'd say he's the one prestigious journalist in New Zealand who is still on TV, who, who speaks the truth to, to a large degree. Okay, now, he's been cancelled. Now, being cancelled, I'm not saying he's been cancelled yet, 
Now, why is he being cancelled? Well, it's not that complicated. During the, I think it was 2010 or 2011, I forget which year exactly, uh, the GCSB, which is the Government Communications and Security Bureau, our equivalent of the NSA, was found to be illegally spying on 80-plus New Zealand activists who had committed no crime, who were merely people who were critical of the government, critical of the legislation, writing blogs about it, etc. All of these people were suddenly under surveillance, and it, and it came out that that was going on. And the Privacy Commissioner got really upset about it, the Human Rights Commissioner got really upset about it, and John Campbell interviews the Prime Minister, John Key. Mr. Campbell says, are you saying the Law Society and the Privacy Commissioner and the Human Rights Commissioner are all wrong? And the Prime Minister goes, yes. <laughs> and it's, it's just like a head-in-your-hands kind of moment. You see how bad the problem really, really is. Because you've got this blatant sociopathic lying scumbag in charge of your country with his keys to the entire uh, 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 cachet of New Zealanders' money, and he's blowing it, lying about it blatantly, and then covering up and surveilling any of the people that might be exposing it, right? And, and after that happened, uh, MediaWorks got a new CEO, Mark Weldon, who's incidentally a personal friend of John Key. And Mark Weldon comes up and he says, you know, I think I want to cancel Campbell Live because the ratings are really bad. <laughs> okay. Now, going back to Stephen Joyce, the former CEO of, of MediaWorks, in the height of the 2011 election, it was uh, their, their second term when they got elected in, um, the Prime Minister got given a whole hour of talk radio on Radio Live, MediaWorks' is Radio Live, for free. They're just like, oh, we're going to call it the Prime Minister's Hour. Now, under election law in New Zealand, it's illegal for you to give a political advertisement without defining it first as a political advertisement. They didn't define it as a political advertisement. What they did instead is they called it the Prime Minister's Hour, but it was on the proviso that that current elected Prime Minister can't talk about politics. And that's why they slipped underneath it. The most recent election, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll, um, I'll finish this off here. The most recent election, there were three things of note. Number one, uh, Darren Watson, who's an incredible New Zealand musician, guitarist, singer, a song called Planet Key. And the song was going viral. Uh, like it, it was very, very popular because people hate this current prime minister, basically to... Uh, they, well, they, they would die to kill him, you know, <laughs> if, 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 if I may be so bold. And I'm just joking, of course, please don't surveil me. Uh, but his song got pulled from the airwaves. The Electoral Commission contacted him and said that because it's a political message during an election, it's illegal to broadcast it. After the election, six months after, just a, just a month ago, in fact, his lawyer and him went into court and they won the case but it's too late isn't it they can't affect the outcome of the previous election because they got effing censored under pain of having fifty thousand dollar fines per offense to shut them up nikki hager who's an award-winning new zealand journalist wrote a book called dirty politics about the kind of uh, tactics that the national-led government and John Key have borrowed from the Republican uh, government in the United States. This kind of uh, name-calling, nastiness, that kind of thing. What they determined and what they found out was that if you play dirty, your supporters are the last ones to get turned off from the political sphere. It's actually your opponent's supporters that go, man, this is dirty, this is disgusting, I'm not even going to bother voting this year. And that's the whole idea because their own supporters are so stupid so blind and have so much faith in the political representative that they're supporting that they'll continue to support them even when they do things that are immoral even when they blatantly lie even when they do things that are absolutely horrific to new zealanders that's the game that's being played here now the author nikki hager of dirty politics 
got raided by the government. Got all his computers, all his workings and everything, contact, address, pages, you name it, was taken by the police. They had his house being searched for like 12 or 14 hours, I think, with his family in there, scared to death. Political censorship is happening in New Zealand. And it's not just happening to the people in the mainstream media. It's also happened to me. Two weeks uh, before the uh, 2014 election, I had released a video, well, three weeks before the election, sorry, I'd released a video called John Key's Real Past Exposed in Six Minutes, chronicling all his banking uh, uh, debauchery, what kind of a sociopath he is, and, th and that kind of thing, right? A lot of really, really nasty, unfortunate facts which everybody who voted for him does not know. And if they did know and voted for him anyway, they'd probably a bit of a scumbag. <laughs> but anyway, two weeks leading into the 2014 election, that video got taken down. Not only that video, but my entire YouTube channel. 3,000 videos, 3.5 million hits was taken off of YouTube. And it said permanently with no right of appeal, but one right of appeal. So I messaged them, and then I couldn't message them again because they said that your email is blocked. Sign in with your YouTube account with that blocked email, which you can't sign into because the email is blocked, and send us a message with that email instead, which is blocked, which we won't allow you to send. <laughs> so it was like a, an infinite loop of me not being able to do anything. So that means that those full two weeks before the election, uh, I was completely out of the game, right, pretty much. And my YouTube video had gotten 7,000 hits in seven days. It's the first seven days. After that, it was uploaded to Facebook because it was the only other platform that I could. And that got taken down off my account as well. Luckily, one of my listeners, uh, Mark, he downloaded it and uploaded it to his own uh, Facebook page. And he's like somebody who doesn't have any, very, virtually any followers or anything like that. He's, he's just a, a listener, just an ordinary guy. And that video, at last count, had something like 11,000 Facebook shares. It was unbelievable, the effect of this video and how popular it was because of the fact that it's loaded with information that I took from some of the best activists in the country who have been researching this guy since he got into power in 2008, his dirty passes, dirty dealings, that kind of thing. It was extremely compelling. And then on the 5th of November, Guy Fawkes Day, to remember the last honourable man uh, to enter Parliament, Guy Fawkes, with the intention of blowing it up, uh, that was when the day that my YouTube channel got restored, coincidentally enough. And I, and I thought, well, this is Vinny for Vendetta. But the fact of the matter is we've got a corrupt judiciary, a corrupt prime minister and an administration, and also massive uh, censorship of people who are critical of him. And that makes us the least corrupt country in the world, according to Transparency International. <laughs> have, I, have I summed it up right enough? Oh, certainly. And I'd like to uh, talk about surveillance in New Zealand because you briefly touched on that. I mean, it's been said that every country, I, maybe there might be a few exceptions around the world, like some third world countries may not apply to this, but it has been said that every country has its own version of the NSA. Everyone is spying on everyone. The NSA is by far the most notorious and the most uh, sophisticated in terms of technology. But I'm going to guess that New Zealand has its own version of the NSA, um, so does it. And also, how did New Zealanders feel when they found out about the Snowden leaks, that the NSA and also the GCHQ and maybe some the China surveillance system, because Snowden did release some things on that, are spying on everybody? Well, it's called the, uh, the GCSB, the Government uh, um, Communications and Security Bureau, GCSB. Now, the GCSB has an NSA office in their building in the capital of Wellington. So that's, that's number one. Number two, uh, Kim.com, who's uh, allegedly one of the worst Internet pirates on Earth, 
uh, was unlawfully surveilled by the GCSB at the behest of the Prime Minister, who was the head of the GCSB, because as Prime Minister in New Zealand, remember how I told you, you can appoint your own ministers. You can also appoint yourself the Minister of Certain Things. So he, he appointed himself Minister of State Surveillance, the Minister for uh, the Rugby World Cup, the Minister for Tourism, etc., etc. Now, surveilling, I think, 88 activists... Um, including uh, Kim.com, not sure if he qualifies so much for the activism, but what was interesting about the Snowden leaks is that Kim.com organized a conference in the Auckland Town Hall uh, called the Moment of Truth. Uh, at the height of the 2014 election season, um, I was pretty upset because uh, I wasn't allowed to uh, bring in my uh, banners and things, my John Key, not wanted posters and and, and that kind of thing, because they, there'd been a previous uh, uh, hall meeting involving uh, Kim.com that was organised by a, uh, a couple of uh, socialists here in New Zealand. And, uh, yeah, they, they kind of don't like me and the way that I go about things because I, I'm i not entirely serious and also I'm discredited as a conspiracy theorist and uh, essentially uh, the word... Uh, now, you know, I'm not going to actually insult these people because I actually understand their predicament. I called up the uh, the privacy commissioner uh, wanting to um, – oh, sorry, sorry, sorry – the New Zealand Council for Civil Liberties. I emailed uh, both their media representatives who both declined to come on my broadcast. And I'm pretty shrewd, so I said to them, okay, is this by chance because I'm a conspiracy theorist and you don't want to be tarred with the brush? And they're like, well, yeah. Okay, so it doesn't matter the fact that these people get called a conspiracy theorist anyway. They can't actually speak out on any media platform with you know, full congruence and being able to speak their piece because they refuse to come on my show, which is the only show in the entire effing country that'll give the activists any kind of platform to really speak in the fullness. Now, in terms of uh, state surveillance, it's been oh, big, big, big news here. Really, really um, a hardcore uh, resistance. But the thing that undermines it all is the fear. Anybody who comes out and speaks out about it starts getting surveilled instantly. Like, that's the belief. And I don't know if that belief is totally unfounded, to, to be honest, because after seeing my YouTube channel get taken down, and uh, things, people getting raided, and all these other kinds of things. Corruption is just rampant in this country. And because the NSA has a, has a uh, office in the GCSB building, uh, what's happened with the uh, Snowden leaks is that they've revealed the Five Eyes plan and uh, uh, Operation Spear or, or something of that nature to confirm that the U.S., and New Zealand and Australia and the United Kingdom and Canada are all tied up together in a surveillance pact that is called, I think, Operation Echelon, which has been going for many, many years. Now, it's illegal under the Bill of Rights to surveil your own people, okay? Illegal to surveil the population of another country and then share your information with that country's government. So they all signed a pact to all spy on each other and share information. So now everybody in an English-speaking country is under, is under broad brush surveillance. Broad brush surveillance is when all data is collected, mostly metadata, you know, who you called, when you called them, how long the conversation went on for, etc. That's actually uh, what analysts are after. They don't need conversations, they don't need the details or anything. What they want is relationship connections. This is called metadata. That's the data that matters, in other words. So that's what they've been doing, is collecting information on hundreds of millions of people. Every conversation they have over a landline, every text message they send, every email, every Facebook message, every form of communication is being data logged, chronicled, categorized, and red flagged for analysis. That's what's going on here. That is the reality that we speak of now. At every point in the last decade, that's exactly what's been going on. Now, what's different about today is that people are now being elucidated to the fact that they're being surveilled. 
by people like Snowden. And guess what happened? After that moment of truth, where Snowden revealed all this information, revealed the, uh, the programs that the United States are running in here, incontrovertible proof that New Zealanders are being illegally surveilled, how, what happened? The national government and John Key, the ones doing all the illegal surveilling, got a bump in the polls. People actually liked them more because they were doing this, is the kind of situation that we're in here. Yes, and some people are concerned that uh, Snowden, if he slowly does release information, he's going to help the powers that be because he's going to acclimate people to the surveillance state. When I had Sherry Edwards on my show, she does voice analysis for people, and she did a voice analysis on Snowden, and she told me that the reason he's not just releasing everything at once, even though he probably could, is because he wants to wear his stu- the stuff like, like a cloak or a shield around him, basically saying, if you try to harm me, I'm going to release something that makes you look bad. And frankly, I'm also inclined to believe that another reason Snowden isn't releasing releasing um, the information all at once is because he feels the human race cannot handle the truth. But um, on that note, um, I would like to talk to you about a couple things that some would say are pet peeves that I have in regards to the conspiracy movement because I have voiced my displeasure about this stuff and I've been criticized for a little could bit. You, for could it you um, uh, uh, give, me, give me a moment to step away and take a, uh, ironically, a wiki leak? I'll, I'll be I'll be back in just uh, just a minute. Uh, I'm just yeah, been sitting here for no the problem. last twenty minutes. Let, 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 I'll be no right problem. Ahead. Go right ahead. I'll cover for you. So yes, folks, I'm going to talk again about how the things that the conspiracy movement does that drive me crazy, refusing to talk about certain things, and also how um, people, some conspiracy people think that society can't handle the truth, and that, of course, is one reason why they won't release things. And uh, there's classic examples of this. Like I said, Snowden, maybe he doesn't think people can handle the truth, so he won't release everything. I've also used Richard Hoagland as, uh, as an example for that, of someone who will not tell the world that... Uh, the moon is artificial because he's not ready to, at least that's what Alex Collier told him. So talk about that with Vinny when he's um, done his little wiki leak here, as he um, likes to call it. It's glad he can use humor. I usually don't have uh, much of a sense of humor, people have told me. In most cases, I don't laugh unless I'm talking to myself. <laughs> a lot of people ask me, why do you always sound and look so serious? Well, I don't know. It's in my genes not to have a sense of humor. I don't know. Michelle Walling once told us uh, that I'm having trouble figuring out Andrew Fisher because I think he's a hybrid. <laughs> she wasn't aware that I was listening when she said that. I actually overheard a conversation where she said that on her. Uh, and now I'm re- back. All right. All right. I'm going to stop talking, shut up and let you. Well, actually, I have to first um, get back to what I was saying about the uh, conspiracy movement doing things that um, that some would say harms the truth movement, but they assert it helps the truth movement. Um, one example, uh, 9-11 is a classic example of this. Um, I discussed in my interview with uh, John Lear and also Jim Fetzer, um, among other things, that it is a provable fact that the planes that hit the Twin Towers on 9-11 were holograms. It is likewise, it is a provable fact that some sort of direct energy weapon took down the Twin Towers. The government has several different types of technologies on both the holographic planes and direct energy weapons to pull that off. So you may not be able to prove exactly which technology they use, but simply proving that the planes were holograms and the Twin Towers were taken down by direct energy weapon is a piece of cake. The problem, however, is that many people in the 9-11 truth movement will not talk about this. Uh, case in point, a couple years ago, a caller called into the Alex Jones show and said, I think John Lear is right when he said the planes were holograms, uh, and it makes sense because the plane plane disappeared into the South Tower. It didn't even slow down as it hit the South Tower. So what do you think, Alex? And and Alex Jones refused to talk about it because he feared that it would uh, discredit the 9-11 truth movement, if you can believe that. (laughs) That was his excuse, though. And um, another example of this is how Alex Collier claimed that after Richard Hoagland uh, gave his uh, Cydonia presentation to the U.N. in the early 90s, Uh, He approached Richard Hoagland and got right in his face and asked him, so Richard, why won't you tell the world the moon is artificial? And he claims that Richard Hoagland's response was, because I'm not ready to. And Hoagland has hinted on a few occasions on radio interviews and such that he thinks humanity cannot handle the truth and therefore conspiracy people need to be careful about what they choose to talk about. Now, the problem I have with this is by refusing to talk about something because you either think people can't handle the truth or because you think 
the thing you're talking about is too crazy to believe that it's going to discredit the truth movement, like the holographic plane thing, like Alex Jones feared. Um, you are putting yourself in the ultimate prison of the fear of what other people think by doing that. Therefore, you, well, you shouldn't do that in any truth movement who does not care about what others think and tries to get the truth out, no matter how crazy the truth sounds, will always be more successful and get farther than a truth movement that refuses to talk about certain things out of fear of what others think. So this whole conflict of whether conspiracy people should go all out and talk about everything, no matter how crazy it sounds, do you feel, or for that matter, maybe do you not feel it's a good idea for them to do that? Well, I'm the opposite of a lot of people um, who live their lives, okay? Some people are professionals, they're qualified, they have reputations to uphold, that kind of thing. So it's, it's much to lose, if they start talking about something for which they can be discredited. And, and, and that's the kind of thing that I no longer fear, uh, and in fact kind of really haven't feared in the first place. I talk about all sorts of crazy stuff on my show, um, and there's a good reason for that. Number one, it's kind of like a, ba a backup plan. So if somebody says, Vinny, you lost credibility, I go, really? When did I have credibility in the first place? I don't think I ever had it. <laughs> So because I don't have any credibility, I can't lose it. And I can still keep talking about all sorts of crazy stuff. I can talk about reptilian cloning rooms. I can talk about UFOs. I can talk about state surveillance, 9-11, or flat earth theory, or, or, or anything that I want, basically. Because this world is full of information, a lot of information and you're not going to be able to sieve through it by saying no I'm going to ignore that 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 basically what you do is you wind up realizing that oh my god this world is full to the brim with crazy crazy topics infinite knowledge that we can all conveniently completely ignore by labeling it a conspiracy theory <laughs> Oh, it's a conspiracy theory, therefore it doesn't exist, and therefore I don't have to do any work, I don't have to watch a documentary, I don't have to read a single effing article, I can ignore what everybody says until the end of time, and that makes it not real, right? That's the situation that we're dealing with. When I was a boy, when I was like 19, a friend of mine introduced me to three things. He introduced me to Michael Rupert's presentation, The Truth and Lies of 9-11, where he lays out the documents of the Bush family and uh, the, the invasion of Iraq and, and all the people who had a pecuniary interest, anybody who had financial gain uh, to do with 9-11. And that was like so amazingly mind-blowing uh, for me that I just burst out laughing because every single time he kept speaking, it was laying out more information that was so outlandish yet real that it was hilarious to me. The second thing he introduced me to was the comedian Bill Hicks, who talked about a lot of these things that we're, that we're going through in society, how, how, how spiritually asleep we are, how dumbed down, how easily distracted, etc. And I think what's happened since then is I've taken that influence and I've really made it my own. Okay. I've, I've been a part of the legalized cannabis movement in New Zealand. I've uh, got more interviews and videos with New Zealand activists on more topics for longer form interviews than any single and in fact all combined media sources in the entirety of New Zealand throughout its history. Me, by myself, did that. Why? Is it because I want to be famous? Is it because I want to be popular? Is it because I want to be rich? No. It is a moral obligation. I saw and was inspired by all the Americans, like Alex Jones, who were exposing scumbaggery. And then I looked at my home here in New Zealand, and I see all these activists doing their work, and I see them getting put into sound bites in the media. And I quit my job. I took my $11,900 worth of uh, shopping vouchers that I got as a bonus for that month's work. I took my five grand cash after tax. I bought myself a Mac, and I lived off the proceeds. And what I did with my spare time was I wasn't just sitting around being an unemployed bum. I was going uh, to public meetings, to protests, and I was filming them. 
Now, what I noticed is that when you see an activist being interviewed on the news, they get five seconds. They say one sentence. When you interview an activist in person for minutes, an hour even, the complexity and the depth of their research becomes apparent, but only then. So that's why I took it upon myself to make sure to give these people the coverage that they deserve, because it is their intense research into the subject matter that has in fact elucidated me as to the reality that is truly affecting my country. And I believed wholeheartedly that my countrymen and indeed people around the world need to have this knowledge shared with them for free and be easily found online, no copyright, so they can download it and re-upload it and edit it in any way that they choose, apart from one that's dissing me, in which case I'll give you a copyright flag for that. But the thing that I found was most interesting is that it doesn't matter how credible the person is. It doesn't matter what kind of evidence that they lay out. It doesn't matter whether they have a, a timeline. It doesn't matter whether they have documents. It doesn't matter whether they are quoting the people. The truth is not enough. Have you ever noticed that? It doesn't matter what you're trying to convince somebody of. If they don't want to believe it, they will not believe it. <laughs> and so I've braved ridicule, pain, suffering, abuse, trolling, stalking, the, the whole nine yards, simply because I'm allowing people to say the truth on my radio show, and I'm not second-guessing them, I'm not attacking them, I'm not hamstringing them, I'm not setting them up, I'm not abusing them or anything. I just want to hear them out, because my elders are very important to me. The reason why they're so important to me is because they've imbibed a lot of knowledge to me, and they have not charged me for it. A lot of people have taken me under their wing over the, over the years. And I believe that those people have a whole lot of the things that I do not. They have the background and research. They have all of, the, all of the knowledge that they can basically summon up at will, and they can prove these things that they claim. I'm not capable of doing that because I don't read government documents. Hell, I don't even watch the news or listen to mainstream talk radio anymore. I threw my television out. So I'm more or less in the dark, but... I'm smart enough to be able to listen to somebody, comprehend what they're saying. I'm experienced enough to know uh, uh, hundreds and, uh, and maybe even a thousand different subject matters and how they kind of work and fit together. That's kind of my unique talent is being able to listen to a complex story and being able to summarize it in one one hundredth of the time without missing any details and give people the exact points that they truly need to know from that entire thing. Now, as a result, I've come to this very important realization that there's been a wedge driven between the elders and the youth. The reason for this being, I believe, and this is a conspiracy theory of my own, that elders possess knowledge and experience and wisdom. The youth possess energy and creativity and hope. Together, the elders and the youth can be incredibly powerful. And so a wedge has been driven in between those two groups of people so that we cannot share that knowledge, that wisdom, that energy, that creativity with each other. And so doing, we become weaker, both the elders and the youth, by not having the interaction that we need. And... I saw all of these people having no idea how to edit a video, having no idea how to record a radio show. This is all technology. This is the young people's world. So it took me as a young man with the energy, with the creativity, um, and with that hope to go out and do for these people what they could not do for themselves, which was giving them a platform. I'm not giving them a voice. They've got their own voice. I'm simply giving them a platform to speak from. That is my part. That is my obligation to my elders. And I'm not doing it for the money. If I was doing it for the money, would I have quit my last job, which I got paid 15 grand for a month's work? No, I freaking wouldn't have. It's 
because I'm employer phobic. I'm, I'm, it's a made-up disease, just like most other mental disease, <laughs> mental illnesses in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, uh, and it means a fear of gainful employment. You know, I've actually had two panic attacks uh, before and after uh, uh, going to a new job. I, I've been struggling, trying to make uh, 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 ends meet as an activist, and it was and it was just impossible. And so I was going to uh, have to just go into uh, of the workforce and then a panic attack the night before and this was even working with my best friend just selling insulation uh, with his company uh, door to door and I couldn't physically do it I, I had a panic attack while I was lying in bed the night before and that realization occurred to me that this is my life now I cannot go back I've jumped the chasm and the bridge has been destroyed behind me I will never be able to work for anybody ever again I can only work with people. And that's the only way that my body can continue to function. That's the only way my mind can stop itself from splitting apart, as if I still maintain some kind of independence, if I still have free will and choice to do what I want to do, which is serve those people who do the work that I cannot do for myself and do the work for them that they cannot do for themselves. In so doing, we form a unity. And that's what I really want to achieve here, to let people know that we're all in the same boat here. We're all slaves. And we all have the same enemy, scumbaggery. The actions, motives, and portents of a scumbag. That is the one thing that is the central creamy nougat right in the middle of everything. Would Monsanto be doing GMO food that killed people and caused sterility in rats if there was no scumbaggery in that organization? No, they freaking wouldn't. Would the pharmaceutical industry be uh, promoting drugs that make people commit suicide by the, by the thousands every year if there was no scumbaggery in that organization? No, they wouldn't. Would the government be mass surveilling people without warrants if there was no scumbaggery in the government? No. So it is that behavior that we're really after, that psychopathic scumbaggery that is essentially the true enemy of mankind. People think, oh, it's socialism or it's, uh, or it's communism or it's this, that or the other. No, 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 no. All socialism and communism is, is a system created by people who are scumbags. Same with capitalism, same with almost every single system that we've grown accustomed to. The problem is scumbaggery is really good at concealing itself from people. It will simply sit there and operate until such a time as people try to expose it. Once you try to expose them, that's when they start to act like who they really are. There's an old saying, how do you expose a fascist? By making them act like it. And if we're divided over these different lines of left versus right or environmentalism versus pollution or, or, or black versus white, man versus woman, these are all just specifically well-designed, well-oiled machines that are there specifically to make people fight with each other so that they will not focus on the scumbaggery that suppresses all of them together. Thanks, Vinny, and if it makes you feel better, I guess I should. Might, might as well look up to you as a little bit of a role model here. Uh, Sean Cohen in the chat room, one of my faithful fans and followers, did a reading on me recently, uh, told me I'll be able to get off blog talk soon and on some other radio programs and make more money, and I guess I could look up to you as a role model. I mean, believe me, I'm trying to do a lot of things right now to make a additional money, a lot of money meditations and such, and subliminal audio to wipe out any negative thoughts I may have about money, even putting donate buttons on some sites and all that, and um, hopefully I'll be able to um, do radio to the point where I can easily rely on contributions like you can, instead of having to work 9 to 5 and uh, do this show. I mean, I do work for a family-run business, so it's not a horrible 9 to 5 job, but it's still 9 to 5 nonetheless, so, uh, but hopefully in the future I'll be able to do what you do, and uh, make a lot of money for my shows to the point where I won't have to do that and I'll have more free time to do more activism like you do. But um, anyway, now it's time for me to talk about 
the thing that I hate talking about more than anything else, but I need to talk about it because you mentioned it a few minutes ago. The whole thing about if people, or should I say sheeple, will not believe something, it doesn't matter how much you tell them, they just won't believe it. And I have been criticized by my listeners and such for saying this, but I need to say it because if I feel if I, I feel in my gut that if I keep saying it, it might offend people, but it'll still help wake people up nonetheless. And that is that, well, one of the reasons it's so easy for governments and the New World Order to get away with all their secrets and conspiracies being exposed, and also the reason why uh, this world it remains a prison planet, is because uh, a very significant percentage of the common people who make up the general public on planet Earth are so paradigmatic, so fearful, and so flat-out stupid that they will refuse to believe something shocking or disturbing, even if the evidence shows that they have no choice but to believe it. I didn't like saying that. But I had to say it for the sake of waking people up. It gets more hard to swallow every time I say it. And the issue here is, to what extent do we, the people that are awake, have the right to hassle the sheeple to wake them up? Now, I firmly believe, yeah, there's no truth that you have the right to do whatever you want as long as you don't harm people. But that raises the question, do people have a right to be sheeple? Because one could make the argument, if you are a sheeple, you are harming society. Because by being a sheeple, you're making life harder for all the other people who are awake. Therefore, you do not have the right to be a sheeple because, well, you're harming society for that reason. And that, of course, raises the question of, is it okay for like people like you and me who are awake to hassle and harass the sheeple to force them to wake up? And, I w and some would even say, we should do to the sheeple what that guy in the movie They Live did to his friend who would not put on the glasses. Now, I think maybe that's going a little too far, but you get what I'm trying to say here. When you're fighting the New World Order that is flat-out evil, sometimes you need to fight fire with fire, some would assert. Therefore, you need to make life miserable for the sheeple to wake them up. I realize it's disgusting for me to say that, some would say, but hey, like I said, I got to say it. So your take on the extent to which we have the right to hassle and harass sheeple, what do you have to say about this very controversial subject? Well, first of all, um, calling somebody a sheeple means you're superior to them. Okay, Now, truth is, they're always insulting people calling them sheep or sheeple. Now, I think this is disrespectful and totally unwarranted which is why I call them slave scum. Now, the, the uh, thing about it is intelligent people can be brainwashed, okay? Just because you're brainwashed and you're believing a lie doesn't mean you're an idiot, doesn't mean you're a moron, doesn't mean you're a sheeple. It simply means that you've been taught to believe something that simply isn't true. And even people who are currently part of the truth movement, who are aware of conspiracy, still continue to believe things that are not true, that they have not actually really seen the evidence for, and these are simply belief structures, right? So is anybody the arbiter of truth? Can you trust one particular source to give you all your information? No. Can you tell uh, what's true and what's not via your own feelings? No. In so doing, the truth is always changing. It's up in the air. However, it is solid. It is measurable. There are things that you can prove to be true or untrue. And I call it the, um, the spectrum box. On one end of the spectrum, you've got absolute BS. You know for a fact that it's not true. You've seen the evidence. It's been documented, etc. It's an absolute lie. Okay, On the other end of the spectrum, it's absolutely true. We've seen the evidence. We've got the documents. We know that this is absolutely factual. In the middle, however, that's usually where a lot of people are. They believe 50% BS and 50% truth, and they're more or less confused. Once you start to realize that you're in the middle, that you are not actually on the end of the spectrum where you know everything, and that's when you start to question what part of the spectrum you're on in the first place. And you start to think to yourself, oh, my God, is everything I know a lie? And in, I'd probably say a large, vast majority of the time, yes, almost everything we know beyond the very basics of life, like I need water and food and shelter and caring and love in my life in order to not go insane or get sick or die, Almost everything that we've ever been taught about everything has been a lie. And when you're going through this entire process, you're going from elementary school, preschool, high school, university education, people are doing their doctorates, going into law. These are merely brainwashing institutions that take you from point A all the way to point Z. 
And once you're there, making your way back to admitting your ignorance, that is a real struggle for some people because they build up an idea in their head that they are a certain way, that the world is a certain way. And once you challenge that, they will have this thing called cognitive dissonance, which will make them see you as the enemy. Okay, so think about this in terms of a child. Imagine your thought and your perception of reality is actually your own child. You've born it into this world. You have raised it. You have fed it. You have cared for it. You have loved it. And somebody comes along and tells you something completely different, uh, it's like them killing your child. How angry do you get at that person for killing your child? Extremely angry. You call them names, you might even hit them. All right? Have you been hit for, for talking about conspiracies? I have. Have you been shoved around in the street for talking about conspiracies? I have. Have you had people uh, give you massive long diatribes and pages of abuse for talking about conspiracies? I have. Because these people are like parents defending their dead child, which I have killed or attacked. That's how they feel in a very physical, visceral way. You are the enemy because you are killing their little baby, their little perception of reality. Now, you shouldn't feel like, oh, oh I'm going to be angry at this person for being angry at me. No, 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 no. Because that's a two, that's a double negative, <laughs> you know. It doesn't it doesn't seem to work that way. All it does is make things get worse. It comes down to two things. Number one, is this person awake enough to have this conversation with me? And if the answer is no, because they're calling you a conspiracy theorist or abusing you, they're not asking questions, they're only making statements and they're repeating lines of propaganda. You can see that they're brainwashed. Block and the scum is gone. Don't interact on Facebook with these people. Just block. And the scum is gone because there's, uh, like I learned in telesales, and I was a number one telesales uh, uh, person, and this is our telemarketers, sorry, uh, for those of you in the United States, one in two people that I got to have a conversation with would buy what I was selling them. The average is one in 16. I was freaking good at explaining something very quickly without using any deception, but getting somebody to trust me out of incredible honesty. And so I know that even though I was incredibly honest, even though I was an incredibly smooth talker, even though I was, prob I, I was literally the best in the company at doing what I did, people would still hang up the phone. People would still get angry. People would still refuse uh, to buy what I was selling uh, about half of the time. And the same thing is true with everybody who's walking around with their little uh, view of the world. As anybody who comes calling has only a chance, only a chance of them accepting the information. And this is it. If they're not ready, they're not going to be asking you questions or clarifications. They're going to be making statements like, for example, that's not true, you're a liar, you're a conspiracy theorist, or that's BS, etc. And there'll and be denial. So those people, leave them. You can't do anything with them, you can't help them. Not by yourself. You can throw in what I call the information grenade. You pull the pin, you chuck it in, you make a statement, and if it doesn't blow up in their face right then and they get excited and they start asking you questions, just like you did. When you got given the information, you changed. And that change wasn't pleasant, was it? Painful. And you cried. And you lost your family and started calling you crazy. A lot of your friends fall by the wayside. You will lose everything that you think you hold dear in order to embrace a new paradigm which is called the truth. So you cannot force people to take that leap. You cannot make them believe the truth. That's why I say the truth is not enough. Nor can you convince anybody either. Doesn't matter what evidence you've got, doesn't matter how well laid out, there are still people who will choose not to believe it. That's what it comes down to. It's called the seventh man. Statistically speaking, if you have a rigidly held belief, the only way that you will start to abandon that belief is if seven or more people, different people, mind you, say the exact same thing that is contradictory to your belief to you. All right? So if you're... If you're the first person to say 9-11 is an inside job to a, to a, to a quote-unquote sheeple, you're not going to be enough. 
and truthers get themselves in a real tizzy about us. They sit there and they're like, but, but they, they, don't, they don't believe the truth. I don't, I don't understand it. I don't understand. Of course you don't because you're no longer brainwashed. The brainwashed don't understand the truthers and the truthers don't understand the brainwashed because the truthers mistakenly believe that they're not still brainwashed. What, you think you watch a couple of documentaries? What, you think you interviewed a couple of people over a couple of years and you've got no brainwashing triggers or anything like that in your head? No. We're not superior. We simply were fortunate enough to have those seven-odd people. And it's not, of course, statistically defined. There's a bell curve. Some people will take seven. Some people will take one. Some people will take 100 people. We're not superior. We're not better. However... We're different, very, very different. But these processes of waking up, learning that your entire life, your perception of yourself and reality in and of itself is a lie, is incredibly traumatic. And we choose to try and blame people for it. Blame the sheeple, blame the government, blame this, that, or the other. Now, I can understand that. But the ultimate thing that I learned is after I stopped blaming my family for being sheeple, encouraging me to get into debt, encouraging me to go get a slave job, encouraging me to watch uh, television and to stop making my own videos, as soon as I stopped blaming them for being brainwashed, they stopped acting so hostile towards me. Because when you're calling somebody names, like sheeple, are they more likely or less likely to listen to what you've got to say if you preface it with an insulting, arrogant, I'm better than you tone? Are they more likely or less likely to be receptive? They're less freaking likely. So getting angry about scumbaggery, specifically directing that anger as people who are not the arbiters or creators of the brainwashing mechanism is unwarranted and disrespectful. There is a way that we can do this. You pull out the pin, you chuck it in, and if they react to you, they start asking questions or whatever, and they accept what you're saying, then you've got somebody that you can start to educate. You can have a proper conversation with them. If they start calling you names or anything like that, just say, okay, this conversation's over. Thank you very much. Hang up the phone. Exactly like I did in telemarketing. As soon as that person ain't selling, as soon as that person I, I realize isn't buying it, phone calls over. I need to make the next call, and the next person will buy it. Okay. Now this turns it into a kind of marketing thing, and uh, I don't like marketing, especially uh, considering most of it and all of its tactics were created by the nephew of Sigmund Freud, Edward Bernays. There's ways of brainwashing, mind controlling, and, and getting people to accept things that they ought to not accept by pulling on their heartstrings, that kind of thing. Uh, I'm always a great believer in transmutation. So you can take something, whether it be evil, whether it be dishonest, and you can put a peg in it and then rotate it and turn it 180 degrees. Use the exact same tactic, but apply that tactic in the exact opposite way of its intended purpose. Just the exact same thing that the government does. They take you a really, really nice thing like, oh, we're going to take care of the children by, by opening up child protective services. That's what they tell people. And then they invert it and they go, okay, well, actually we're nine times more likely to sexually abuse your child than, than the parent. <laughs> okay? So we've got to do the exact same thing, I think, is we've got to turn this marketing around. Instead of making people feel happy that they know the truth, they need to feel angry. They need to feel upset. They need to be depressed. They need to go through all those rigorous stages of grief. Now, what people don't know a lot about grief is that they've uh, lost a loved one is after the depression, after the anger, after the denial, after all these stages of grief, at the very end of it, the one that you're after is acceptance. You need to accept what's happening. You need to accept who you really are. 
You need to accept what your own talents and limits are, etc. Only then will you feel at peace. Will you not feel aggrieved by these things you have seen, by these things that are being done to you, and by the reactions of the quote-unquote sheeple that shouldn't affect you anymore once you've achieved acceptance. I don't believe I've achieved acceptance yet. And it's said in the psychology papers that not everybody achieves acceptance. It's not for everybody. (laughs) I mean, it's the ideal. But many of us will still hold a pin uh, on our fellow man. We will blame people who are just ordinary for things that David Rockefeller did. You know, somebody was uh, telling me at a party, oh, Vinny, you're smoking cigarettes, you're supporting big tobacco. And I go, oh, okay, how did you get to this party? By chance, did you uh, arrive here in a vehicle, a car, right? And they're like, yeah, yeah. By chance, did you fill that up at a, at, a, at, a, at a big Seven Sisters oil gas company? And they're like, yes, yes, I did. Well, you're supporting big oil. Okay, so we're blaming each other for making the only choices that are really available to us is not the way we're supposed to go about it. If you're going to direct your anger, direct it at the people who are responsible. Direct it to the people like Bill Gates, David Rockefeller, Zbigniew Brzezinski, Amschel de Rothschild, dead or living, it matters not. Be accurate at about who is really at fault here. If you cannot do that, then all you're doing is attacking the branches of tyranny while others strike at the root. Thank you very much, Vinny. By the way, we have a call here. I might as well get this caller on. Um, it says here, area code, uh, well, the number is 111111111. If you know who you are, you are on the air. What's your name, where you're from, how you doing? Or are you just listening? Okay, I'll take. Say. <laughs> yeah, hey, probably uh, someone who's just one of my listeners uh, told me told me uh, something interesting about. It. He says the uh, the difference between one of the sheeple and a conspiracy theorist is the sheeple have an excuse for doing nothing about the conspiracy. We don't. Once well, you know makes... about it, then you're obligated to do something about it. And well, um, makes... you know, like we get insulted and we get called conspiracy theorists. Uh, so uh, another listener of mine, Barry, he said, you know what the opposite of a conspiracy theorist is? And I go, what? And he says, it's a coincidence theorist. Somebody who thinks yeah, everything happens by sheer coincidence. There's no background deals, no such thing as deception, no such thing as human nature, no such thing as greed, no such thing as psychopathy. No, 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 no. Everything's all done for altruistic and sound commercial reasons. <laughs> well, on right. that spectrum between conspiracy theorist who thinks everything's planned and the person who thinks everything's coincidence, even though a conspiracy theorist can be insane, and believe me, if you think that there is no such thing as a crazy conspiracy theorist, you're freaking out of your mind. If you think that every conspiracy theorist is crazy, on the other hand, you're totally out of your freaking mind, right? Whereas if you're a coincidence theorist, dude, you're the most insane, batshit, crazy person who's walking the earth right now because you literally believe everything that a person or an authority tells you. And that's freaking dangerous. It has never throughout history been a good thing to blindly follow authority of any kind without your own moral compass. Because once you allow other people to make your moral decisions for you, that's when the entirety of society suffers and falls by the wayside. Because once you reduce all the individuals into a collective, that's when the individual no longer matters. That's when you no longer matter. And I'm telling people that human beings matter. We are important. Each and every one of us has our unique skills, gifts, talents, and abilities that no other human being on the earth has in our own unique way. And we still, for a large part, have creativity. So one thing that psychopaths don't have, a powerful thing, that we do, and we have it in spades, creativity. Psychopaths have to steal ideas. They have to distort them and mimic them. They can't come up with something out of nothing like the rest of us can. That's the difference between being a human and being an animal. We can think about things that don't exist, never existed whatsoever, not even a precedent 
for their existence. And we can build and then will something into reality out of the immaterial realm. So you've got the fifth dimension up here, which is your thoughts or whatever, and then you can compress it down and you can build a device like a cell phone or something. Goodness knows how somebody came up with that idea or how to, do, how to invent it or how to make it work. That kind of thing. That's our unique power, and people are being convinced. And they have been convinced a long time ago that they don't have that power, that they don't have that creativity. They've been discouraged from using it. And just like any muscle that you stop using, it begins to atrophy and grow weak. It's our creativity, I think, that will save us from scumbaggery, namely because scumbaggery isn't creative. It's just evil and manipulative. There's a difference. Right, and that sort of ties into what people like David Icke have said about how the Archon control system has no creative imagination, and we do, and that's why they need to use us to help create their world. But um, there are, one thing I want to talk about, uh, Vinny, um, I don't really need to get into your life story about this. I know it, it's kind of controversial. I know you did talk about it in your interview with uh, Andrew Bartzis, but I presume that one reason you're uh, trying to get cannabis legalized, so to speak, is because of your problems in the past in which you – um, got caught with that stuff. Like I said, you don't want to talk about it here. That's fine. Anybody can listen to your interview with Andrew Bartzis to learn about that. But the thing I want to address with you about this is the idea that cannabis and other drugs are illegal is a complete and total illusion because the things, well, the vast majority of things that we call laws are not actually laws. They are what someone in government considers to be public policy and anything that someone in government considers to be public policy is not binding upon the general public. I mean, here in the United States, the only things that be, can be considered laws are the federal and the 50 state constitutions and the bills which are signed into law by the governors, provided they go through the proper legal channels in the state constitutions. I'm guessing there, there is some, there's some equivalent to that in New Zealand. But the point I'm trying to make is things like statutes, ordinances, codes, and even case law. They're not binding upon the common people. They're just public policy. So the idea that cannabis is illegal is a lying illusion. Um, and I've always told the, the cannabis movement and other legalized drug movements, you got this all wrong. Don't be telling people to legalize substances. Telling, tell people instead that society has been suckered into um, believing that things are illegal when they're not actually illegal. And that implies that the vast majority of people that either have criminal records or are in prison deserve to have their criminal records expunged and or be released from prison because what they did is not technically a crime. Now with uh, now that I've told you that, do you think maybe my method of telling people what it's not actually illegal, it's against public policy, so we've been suckered, is probably the better way to go about approaching this issue? Okay, question. How many states have legalized cannabis using your method? None. How many yeah. have legalized cannabis using the original route? Several. Okay, so first of all, your, your method's thrown right out, not to be too insulting about it. Second of all, uh, what's a law? A law is something that is backed up with force. That's my definition for it. So when I got arrested for cannabis, I would have had to take out four police and their dog by myself in order to not get arrested for it. And once I killed those four police and that dog, Every single police officer in the city that I was in would have wanted to kill me. That is the use of force. That is what the law is. Now, I have spoken to a number of people in the free man movement, for example. A good friend of mine, Bill Turner, who's come up with these amazing legal methodologies for going into the private outside of these uh, criminal statutes and things of that nature. So he managed to be successful. And in his success, he managed to lose his job, lose his house, lose all his money, lose his car, lose every single position he had, and lose his family, and now he's free. That's the consequence of freedom. People think that freedom doesn't cost you. It will inevitably cost you everything. Whatever kind of freedom you want, you have to be able to lay down on the spikes and let them go through your body in order to obtain what you want. People want a, a painless existence. They want a stress-free existence. I'm saying that through cynicism and by looking at reality, anybody who thinks that they can live a life free of pain is either delusional 
or they've been speaking to a very, very talented marketer. <laughs> right? Now, in terms of legalization, um, I, if, if that tactic worked, which it has in, in the general legalization route, I say we play it out to its logical conclusion because the truth about cannabis is, well, basically everybody knows it. But it's whether or not there's the political will to say it. So if somebody's like going, mm, 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 I, I don't want to come out and say that, that I'm a cannabis user because I might lose my job or I might go to jail or I might have this, that or, or the other happening. I don't want to grow some plants in my, in my garage because I could go to jail for up to three to five years or something like that. I think those are completely valid arguments because you get real consequences for speaking truth to power. And a lot of people, if they have dependence, children, uh, uh, disabled uh, partners or, or, or something of that nature, often people will choose their obligation of taking care of those that are around them and right in front of them before they will choose to take care of other people. Now, I can't argue with that, nor can I argue with people who choose to sacrifice their entire life for the benefit of others. I've known many, many people who have been in the legalization movement in New Zealand. A lot of these people are my friends. We're on a first names basis. We've worked together for a, a number of years, put on conferences, held countless protests. I've, I've earned them hundreds of thousands of hits on YouTube with all their protest videos. And what all those people have in common is despite the fact that they were correct and the law was wrong, they have all been in front of of a judge. Many of them have been in jail because when you cannot protect yourself with the use of force against those who have a monopoly of force, you cannot win. He who wins in a fight is he who has the biggest stick. And it, and it just comes down to that. It's quite simple. How exactly do we take that away from them? I well, don't I want to address I want to actually address that right now because there are people out there who claim they have methods. I mean, people like Santos Bonacci, who, by the way, just got sentenced to six weeks in prison for contempt of court because he was trying to defend some people with drug charges by putting a social media campaign against a judge who was convicting them. And now that judge had enough of what he was doing. So they um, want him him locked up for uh, six weeks. But Santos is, as of now, a... Uh, free man. I mean, if some of the stuff Santos put out was slanderous, like foul language and hateful speech, then that's not really um, free speech. So I guess Santos deserves to get arrested for that if he did that. But uh, the point I'm trying to make is he, Santos Bonacci, has his own method of trying to um, disprove the courts. Like he claims that the birth certificate straw man thing, it is a real phenomenon. It's a legal fiction. And uh, since the word corporation comes from what is related to the word corpse, which implies death, and also because gravestones. I, I, I understand, I understand. Um, but what's, what's different about this here is the theory doesn't match up with the action, okay? For example, can you name me one person who's done the sovereignty free man or straw man thing, whatever the name it is, that one, didn't get arrested, harassed, or tortured by the authorities, two, still has all their private property, their house, their car, their boat, Three, didn't lose their children, partner, or family in the process. Four, currently has a good life, good job, and a happy family. And number five, has no post-traumatic stress disorder or mental or social problems. You can't name a single one. Well, and, and I... this was my point. Um, this, this is actually my original point, is that in order to go into this movement and try to take on the authorities by yourself, you lose every single time. Well, hang, hang on just time. a minute. Hang, hang on a minute. I'm not, I'm not telling. Minute. I'm not saying this. Whoa, 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 let me finish. Let me finish. Now, what I'm saying is that we shouldn't let these people do this alone. They are they are laying themselves down in front of these evil scumbags and exposing this ter terrible system, and we sit back and watch them do it. Don't support them. Don't give them a house to stay in. Don't give them a car to drive around in. Don't donate to them. That makes me freaking sick. That's why I have all these people who've gone through these traumas, who have lost all that they have on my radio show to tell the full story, to explain the evidence and the methodologies so that they can be helped. Because when somebody does a very important thing, 
like proving that the courts are a lie or that the, uh, the, 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 the tickets that you get for parking and speeding and the arrest records and everything is completely unlawful and nobody hears about it, nobody sees the details, it's almost like they didn't do it at all. It's like they've suffered for nothing. It's like they've taken they've had their car and their house and their family and everything taken off them and their health as well, their mental well-being. These people are victims of a horrific system. And what I really, really get frustrated about is people promoting this as if it's consequence-free, as if you can suddenly just go in and, come and walk out after going through this entire process, in some cases 700 pages of documents that you've got to read, virtually memorize, and be able to argue this in court, get arrested unlawfully, have to defend your home all the time, be under surveillance, be pulled over by the cops when you're going down to the shop to get a bottle of milk, to be arrested outside your home in front of your wife and child and be taken to the Henderson Valley Police Station where you were tortured, naked, bound like a turkey for two days over the weekend without food or water. This is the kind of thing that needs to have a huge light shone on it, that we need to be there for these people to help them tell their stories, to protect them and support them while they're going through it. Because at the moment, they are simply a nail sticking up underneath a hammer, and they all get hammered. They get deported or whatever. They cannot be successful until we come together to support these particular individuals who are taking a stand on behalf of the rest of us. And I believe it is a moral obligation for anybody who knows anything about the free man or straw man movement is number one, support those people who are actually blazing the trails there. And I'm not talking about like, oh, keep up the good work. I'm talking about actually effing be there when they're in court. Effing be there when they're trying to get, when, when uh, cops are trying to arrest them at their home. Physically stop these scumbags from messing with these people. Otherwise, their sacrifice is in vain. Otherwise, the torture will only continue because we are too afraid to be leading, by, by, to follow their example, right? That is the thing that really, really frustrates me is people promoting it as if it doesn't have any consequences. And then those people who are actually going out there and suffering the consequences get no support after the fact, just promotions as if there's no consequences. You see what I'm saying? There's a whole spectrum of, of, of information on here. And I'm sorry I got upset about it because a lot of my friends have done this and terrible things have happened to them and I haven't been able to help them. Even though I have them on my radio show or anything like that, nothing's changed because other people just pat them on the back and say, oh, good on you, bro, good on you for doing this to the system. And they're screwed. Their entire life is ruined. They've laid themselves a, a, a sacrificed on an, on an altar for us. And the disrespect... That I, that I feel is inherent in not explaining the true trauma and struggles that they're going through is really enraging to me. Right, right. But but there is another solution I wanted to address to you. By the way, there is another caller, area code 330. I'll get you on the air right after I ask Vinny this uh, question. I promise to just stick around. Um, other people that w try to offer solutions to how to beat the core system, they say the whole straw man, free man thing, that it may be true and all, but they're making things more complicated than it needs to be. In order to win in court, people like Eddie Craig and Randy Kelton of Rule of Law Radio, who I both had on my on my show in the past, they assert that in order to beat, whenever you're being charged with a crime, and I would put the word crime in quotation marks, in which you do not cause or intend to cause harm to another person or property through either negligence or deliberate intent, you will always find that attached to the so-called crime that you committed, be it selling drugs, a traffic ticket, or any other non-harm causing crime, they will always attach a commercial nexus. You can prove through the statutes and codes that by virtue of the fact that the legal definition of a word will always be different than the standard English dictionary definition, you will find that it can be shown that they have attached a commercial nexus to the crime and commerce is something governments have authority to regulate to the point where they do have some leeway in taking away some of your rights. Not all your rights, but some of your rights because they can regulate it. So that's why they do that. Now, people like Eddie Craig have said in order to win the case, you need to 
object to the commercial nexus, like in the case of a traffic ticket, like the words transportation, driving, operate, and vehicle. Whenever the prosecution uses those words in court in order to fight the ticket, you would say objection to the use of the word like transportation. It assumes facts, not evidence, and requires a sworn statement by the fact witness. And you're saying that because you understand that's a commercial specific term. Likewise, you can do the same thing with drug charges like transportation and distribution. You will always find that with a drug related charge. Um, now, other people like Randy Kelton have told me, if you want to win in court, just act like the statutes and the codes apply. All the checks and balances that you need to win your case are in that thing. These tyrants in the government and the New World Order, they are so evil and corrupt, they actually have to make very strict laws to keep themselves in line. And that gives us, the common people, the ability to use their own laws to beat them black and blue at every turn. And Randy Kelton has asserted me, anybody who but, says you stand no choice against the people and these tyrants in government don't know what they're talking about. If you sue them at every turn and if you use the statutes and codes to find the check and balance and like use that check and balance every time they do something wrong, in the end, you will rattle the chain enough and you will be able to beat them. So what do you have to say to all this? Well, in order to in order to do that, I applaud everybody who tries. Um, I, I just know that they'll spend a lot of time in court, and they'll be harassed by the cops, and they might get tortured or uh, uh, steamed in a, in, a, in solitary confinement or anything uh, like Dan Clifford does. So, in, in my opinion, if you're going to go after the legal fiction thing, understand that that is the reality, and that you are doing this as a willing sacrifice for future generations, because this generation currently is going to see virtually no benefit from all of your exploits. It is only maybe 10 years down the track from now once you've inspired others to do the same thing, once you reach that kind of critical mass that any real difference for everybody will be achieved. And that's a huge achievement in, in, in a decade, right? And I think that the biggest achievements that mankind has ever really uh, uh, come through often comes down to a few very determined individuals who won't back down regardless of the consequences what i'm saying is that these people need our support and we shouldn't just pat them on the back we should be there with them well said you mentioned dean clifford he was recently released uh hopefully he'll stay released for a while uh okay but anyway area code 330 you are on the air what's your name where you're from what's your question well, um, I guess the first statement is um, right on for having this guy on. Um, the, Thank you. the point is, is that uh, you know that human sexual slavery and rape is protected equally under the same system. Yeah, we've got a, a massive uh, child trafficking and pedophile problem here in New Zealand. Uh, in fact, five members of parliament that are currently sitting in peace for the ruling national government um, have suppression orders on well, if, child if, if I may, sexual abuse. It, within yeah. the U.S., in the U.S. Congress, there are eight laws of immunity for people who end up in our federal government. They were sexually, many were sexually abused as children, but within the military and federal government, there are eight laws of immunity that protect the abusers and the Justice Department will not hold them accountable. There's no place in America where people who have been put wrongly into human sexual slavery, been drugged, brutalized, um, and... Okay, can and, I make a statement here? Yes. Americans are very, very isolated, and so doing, they think that America's situation is unique. It's not. The exact same thing that is happening to you in every single way in your nation is happening to all the people in New Zealand, all the people in Australia, all the people worldwide. There'll just be a different accent, different languages, or different names of organizations. But the way that they all operate is so similar that you can't separate them. Okay? And, so, and I agree with you. For example, you, 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 you mentioned about, uh, for example, how they write the legislation to protect the abusers. Mm -hmm. Now, funnily enough, the people who write the protection, uh, uh, who write the child abuse legislation in New Zealand are what's called Queen's Cross Medal winners, okay? You know, those kind of people that will get like a Medal of Honor, Medal of Valor, or, or some kind of commendation uh, from Congress or, or the President or whatever. They'd be handed a medal for their great service to humanity. Those are the people that write the child abuse legislation. Those are the people who write the legislation to protect the abusers. Those people have a secluded home on Murawai Beach outside of Auckland, our main city, that has soundproof windows and walls, and they call it the Candy House. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I interviewed the woman who was actually married uh, to the son of that of that couple who own that house, who have those medals, who write the child abuse legislation, and the kind of thing that was really, really um, terrible. And I, I actually had to take two months off from my radio show after interviewing that woman. She was around in my house for six hours. We recorded three hours of it on the, on the radio show, but for full six hours, she wouldn't stop talking because this is what happens. When you're so right. badly traumatized and somebody's finally willing to listen to you and not call you crazy, you unload everything onto them. And right. that was too much for me. I right. couldn't do anything, literally, for the next two months. I sat on my ass playing video games and watching movies, just trying to forget about it before I could go back on air and continue to work. And I'm actually in the same situation now uh, where I had um, Jay Parker, who's a member of the uh, Illuminati family, who so was lowered into a coffin by his, by his father and then into a grave and being told that God does not recognize you in the book of life at the age of like five or six years old. And I've had to now go on a, on a break since then. I've been on a break for about a week and a half or so. So, yeah, I mean, I, I completely understand uh, where you're coming from, and it's unfortunate that it's not an isolated incident with some this global pedophile trafficking and protection network. And right. the people who really expose it, who have the information, a lot of them go missing, uh, a lot of them get killed, and it's yeah, it's the most traumatizing topic that you can ever go into. And if, if the listening audience uh, might want to heed my word, uh, what Jordan Maxwell told me is that you get what you pay for. You start looking into the darkness of this world, some of it will come back with you. Don't go into it thinking it's going to be free of consequence. That's all I'm saying. Right. <clears throat> but if uh, you could possibly give the uh, the, the uh, speaker my phone number, um, I would love to talk to you because, again, there's 57 questions that came out of the U.S. military, and those 57 questions threw out any level of abuse they were implemented in the 1970s, rolled out across this country, the U.S., in the 1985, and were trained to police and to attorneys who became future judges. And that was to disregard victims of these crimes. Oh, yeah, there's, okay. a, so there's always asking... a trial. Um, there's, a, there's a trial to this, and I call it, um, if you've heard of fractal universe theory and you know what a hologram is Mm -hmm. once you zoom in on a section of a hologram that will start to get bigger and bigger but then it starts to repeat the exact pattern that you saw when you first started zooming in and then it keeps zooming in and then it keeps repeating the pattern over and over in an infinite loop that's called fractal um, some people think it's fractal universe. Like, for example, it goes from a cell to the Earth to the uh, to the galaxy to to a red dwarf star cluster to the universe, and then the universe is one small cell and a much larger organism. That kind of thing. Now, to understand the world and how it works, understanding the fractal idea is very important. Understanding scumbaggery and then combining the two is precisely how it works. Fractal scumbaggery. For any kind of scumbag that you can think of, or any kind of scumbaggery, as soon as you start looking into it, you'll start to see that all of these same kinds of scumbaggery and different forms of scumbag start to appear simultaneously. So it's not just the fractal, though. It's also a fractal rabbit hole. So you'll go down one rabbit hole, and then you'll suddenly realize that there's an entire spider web of different rabbit holes going in all these different directions. That's why people don't understand the whole system. That's why people like to do things like, uh, for example, intense research into one particular subject matter so that they understand that one. The problem is it's not working in isolation, and I think sometimes we need to understand the the pillar of exactly how much workings are going on behind the scenes, how many of these little connections there are before we get that kind of full picture and understanding that we truly need before we can start making a difference to the whole system in and of itself. But it's those people who are doing that specific research, who are getting the details, who are getting the documents, who are reciting the evidence that will actually trigger people that are listening into doing something. For example, um, 
Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm ranting. Let, let, no, I'm sorry. Let, I'm ranting. Please go ahead. Let me ask you. Let me ask you a question. Yeah, just so you know. By the way, I just want to quickly point out there, the live feed for this show is going to go off in eight minutes and forty-five seconds. So just try to wrap it up. I do want to tell Vinny one more thing when you're done. Well, my my question would be: Do you think that there's a, another side program in that side program, which is really a distraction from people stepping up and and attempting to mobilize? in safeguarding their children or safeguarding even um, standing up against what becomes human sexual slavery is mm-hmm. is the fact that they're doing this whole thing of, well, forgive yourself and you need to forgive the people who did this to you. See, to me, I find that that is another level of programming because why would you want to forgive the people who did this? They have every intention of continuing to do it to other people. And so I think they use both the um, the religious as well as that you can, you know, you can only uh, forgive yourself and then forgive them to, to move on with your life. Your thoughts? Well, I, I, play, I play a lot of strategy games. Now, when you're defending yourself uh, in a strategy game against a number of attackers, you need several lines of defense. You need stealth troops in one particular area who can snipe out and thin the numbers of your enemies as they come into your base. You need landmines to be laid directly in their path of a tank so that they get delayed further by that. And your last line of defense is is your normal base weapons designs and and things of that nature which will kill anything that gets anywhere near them. And the same is true of defending the lie. You need lots of different lines of defense. And I think that's precisely what you've kind of touched on there, is they've got all of these separate ways of diverting and defending and confusing uh, the the will of people to discover the truth by encapsulating it with a number of different branches of authority. So, for example, if you wanted to con- if you wanted to steal somebody's child, for example, and rape them and get away with it, you're going to need a couple of things. You're going to need a cop a doctor, a lawyer, and a social services worker, and a judge who are all on the take in order to take the child from point A and sell them into sex trafficking all the way to point Z. All right? If you have those ducks lined up in a row, who are your parents going to go to for help? They're going to go to a doctor and say, this guy's raped my child. And he'll go, no, they didn't because he's on the take. They'll They'll go to the nurse, same thing. They'll go to the cop same thing, they go to the lawyer and he'll go, yes, yes, I'll support you, I'll, I'll represent you, and what he does is he winds up giving the judge the exact things that he needs in order to take your child off you legally. Right. So once you have all of those different diversions, all of those different things, everything that, basically it works like this. Vinny's two principal assumptions of life. Number one, if a statement is made from an official source and they say that they're doing something and then there's a reason for doing it, It's the exact opposite for what they're telling you it's for. And assumption number two, if it tastes real nice, but you can't make it in your own kitchen with ingredients that you can find or grow yourself, then it's a soft kill by a weapon. Yep. And and the people you named, I saw that in the military. I've seen it outside the military. It's all the same system. You betcha. You're right on. I don't trust people with authority. I don't trust people with authority, just what I'm trying to say. Well, uh, I've come to believe the same thing. I saw it in the military, uh, went through it in the military, and the VA has for well over 23 years done nothing but brutalize these victims and and deny them any right of recovery. Yep. And they're vaccinating them. I mentioned that in my news segment at the beginning of the show. Um, By the way, you said something about a phone number. Whose phone number were you asking for? Uh, If you could give mine to your... your, um, Yes. Uh, okay. You don't mind me reading your off, entire um, phone number on the air right now? No, no, no. I, I please don't give it okay. to the the guest privately. Uh, okay. Let me just write it down here. Hold on. Okay. Well, oh, by the way, I'm I'm on break until uh, July the fourth, so I can finish my uh, documentary. So I won't be calling you until at least then. Not a problem. All right. All right. Thanks for the um for the call. I'll make sure your number. I'll send Vinny a message on Facebook with your number. Okay. All right. Take care. Later. Uh, Vinny, there is one more thing I want to end on before we call it a night. Uh, the show will end in uh, four minutes. Um, but quickly, I remember you saying in your interview with Andrew Bartsis, um that you discussed how the 
universe the, um, will always give you what you need. And one example you gave, like you were desperate for money and then someone unexpectedly gave you a, a big donation. And now they, they won't give you what you want unless maybe you do a lot of meditations to use the law of attraction to your advantage. But in regards to giving you what you need, can you validate that that is the truth? Uh, just so you know, you got two minutes, 45 seconds to finish up on this before the light feeds off. Well, I'm a uh, b- big believer in synchronicity, meaningful coincidence, and uh, these kind of things happen uh, to me almost on a daily basis. Um, let's say, well, that that thing that I told Andrew was uh, I got up one morning and I was like, okay, it's bill day. What have I got to pay? I've got to pay my rent, my power, my internet. That's 500 bucks. I don't have 500 bucks. So I go to my computer and check my PayPal, and guess what's in there? 500 bucks. A donation from one particular listener. A couple of weeks later, I was sitting there at my, uh, at my computer. I woke up late and my, my show was on early and I had to jump on and quickly do it before even having any breakfast or coffee or whatever. And then my show ended. And I was like, man, I'm hungry. I really want to meat pie. And then all of a sudden there's this. And it's my mate Dan at the door. And he's gotten me a meat pie. <laughs> You know, and those are just just two examples. And this this kind of thing happens to be on more or less a daily basis. And the conclusion that I've made is, uh, if you want returns from the universe, you have to serve for ten times as long as you wish to be served. So, for example, if you want one person to help you, you need to help ten people. And because I'm interviewing between five and ten people a week and I consider that helping them by getting their word out and what have you, that means I'll have one person really go out of their way uh, to help me every week, right? Uh, So that's kind of how I live my life. Whenever uh, I'm in trouble, I ask for help. And help always, always comes in the exact amount that I need at the time. It never happens ahead of time. It never happens uh, after the fact. It always happens exactly in the right amount that I need it in terms of money and at the right time that I need it in terms of bill day or whatever. And that's just monetarily. There's other things as well which synchronistically happen for you when you're helping people, when you're doing what you're supposed to be doing in a real cosmic kind of sense here. You know, I mean, some people might think it's all airy fairy and it's all up in the air and new agey or, or, or whatever whereas me i think about it in practical terms i serve my community as best as i can to help the truth get out there with fun and love and caring in so doing Whenever I need somebody to care for me, I need somebody's love, I need somebody to pay a bill for me, I have that much credit in the community bank of that consciousness that I have affected that when I ask for help, people have an obligation to help me back. Now, that didn't always work like that. It it took me from, uh, I think, maybe 2008 through to 2012 before I started garnering enough donations on a weekly basis to even pay my bills. Beforehand, it was my my wife working full-time, supporting me that whole time. And now I'm supporting my wife, doing her uh, gardening business. And things go around, they come back to you, but ultimately... As I said, you have to be doing what you're supposed to be doing. You have to be doing something that's right, something that feels right primarily. When I quit my job, after getting all that money, I called my friend John Eisen, who's the editor of uh, Uncensored Magazine, uncensoredpublications.com, for those in the United States who want to order a copy of that magazine that's only now being distributed there, thank goodness, Uncensored Publications. I asked him, you know, I, I, I want to quit my job. What should I do? And he asked me this one question. I never forget it. Does it feel right? And by George, it did. And I have not worked full time for a scumbag organization. I have not taken money from advertisers that I don't agree with. I haven't done anything wrong since then. I have only helped people. And as a result, people have helped me, and I am incredibly grateful for every dollar I receive, for every moment that I am still alive, for every interview that I do, for every bit of knowledge that is imparted to me. 
I am grateful to be who I am doing what I'm doing, but I had to sacrifice an awful lot and help many people who I respect greatly in order to be in this position. And I did that because I was the only one who could. He who has the ability has the responsibility. So if anybody's listening here and they, they want to do this thing or that thing or the other, but then you want to make excuses for it and say, oh, I'll leave it till next week or anything. No, 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 no. You, you have to do it now. You have about five seconds to react to a thought in your head before your brain pulls the emergency brakes and stops you doing it. You think to yourself, man, I want, I want to do just pump some weights, you know, just do, just do a set of 20 or, some, or something like that. And then you go, okay, I'll just delay it for a bit. You won't do it. I want to write this script or I want to do this radio show and then you make excuses and then you don't do it. Get that inspiration the moment it happens and then start doing it and then make it work. Make it work! Nobody's going to help you. And the first big mistake people make is they ask for help. Vinny, can, I, can you uh, help me do my radio show? I'm just starting up. I've got absolutely no experience whatsoever, no equipment, no nothing, and I need your help. Uh, actually, bro, you don't need my help. What you need is to realize that you can and will help yourself if only you believe in yourself. As soon as you've got doubt, as soon as you think you need somebody else to tell you what to do or to hold your hand, that's when you will fall on your face and fail. Take personal responsibility. Commit to it. You're going to die anyway. These, these scumbags have hatched a global plan of brainwashing, enslavement, enslavement, and subsequent extermination. They are planning it, and they are moving towards their goals, while you sit and listen to me on the radio, when you could be making your own videos. You could be making your own radio show. You could be inventing a free energy device. You could be making health products for somebody. You could be feeding the homeless. You could be contributing in some way to raising the consciousness level of our society. Once you have that realization, once you feel that obligation, then you must act. Don't stop once you've had that idea in your head. Don't keep listening to douchebag talk radio show hosts like me looking for more inspiration. You've already got enough. Go out and do it. There is no time for delay. People are dying every single day. People are being abused, mistreated, and people continue to believe lies and propaganda and brainwashing. And you have the ability to stop that from happening. And if you do not take action, then whatever happens to humanity is partly your fault. It's only once you know that there's something wrong that you can do anything to stop it. Well said. And like it's like it says here on my description, one of your major goals in life is to train others to do what you do so they will no longer need the help of people like you and, and me too to wake up humanity. So uh, just so you know, uh, people didn't hear a lot of what you said there because the live feed is off, but I will upload this interview to, to YouTube and everybody will be able to hear everything, including the four minutes or so after the live feed. But well, with that said, uh, Vinny, the show has come to an end, and I'm going to tell you the same thing I tell all of my guests. Vinny, you are a fascinating individual. Loved having you on, and I have no doubt that I could do another show with you. But one of my goals with this radio show is to get as many different people on my show as possible before I give any one specific guest double dips, as I feel that is the fairest, most impartial, and most informative way of doing a show that seeks to expose the true and false nature of reality. With that being said, Vinny, so I loved having you on. I probably will not be asking you to come on my show again, but that's only because I need to give thousands of other fascinating individuals the chance to have some glory on my show. Believe me, though, I'll spread this far and wide to make the most of this interview. That's a promise. Thanks, man. All right. And Take uh, care. if people want to uh, check out my uh, website, it's the thevinnieeastwoodshow.com. That's Vinny with a Y because it's the most important question. And Eastwood as in go ahead, make my news. Well, you can search Vinny Eastwood on YouTube there, and uh, my YouTube channel is Mr. News, that's MR News, Gorilla Media, uh, that's Gorilla with one R, not, a, not like the ape, but actually like a, uh, like a soldier, 
So Mr. News Guerrilla Media, that's my uh, YouTube channel. And uh, I think I need about six more subscribers before I hit 20,000. That's going to be great. Thanks very much, uh, Andrew, for uh, having me on the show today, bro. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Take care and good luck. Later. All right, folks, that's the end of this. I will be having Rob Dew of InfoWars on my show uh, next week. Uh, so he'll be the second InfoWars reporter I've had on my show. The first was Dan Badandi. It'll be somewhat news-related, but also um, we'll have to be doing some uh, things in general, like how truth movements behave and all. So I guess, um, well, this interview, it'll probably be very similar to, to this interview that I had with Vinny and also the interview with Dan Badandi. It'll be somewhat similar to that one. But Rob Dew will be the guest on the show next week. First time I see him since uh, he and I and the rest of the gang got assaulted in Dallas on the 50th anniversary of the JFK shooting. Uh, that was an experience. <laughs> but uh, that's the end of this show. Rob Dew next week. This is Andrew Fisher signing off. Enjoy the rest of your trek throughout Infinite Consciousness, everybody.